think you guys can see me. Can anyone see me? Hi, everyone. I don't know if you can see me. There I am. Hi, can you guys see me? Hi, Stacy. We have so many people here. I'm so excited. Can you guys see me? Now I think you can see me. I think you can. Tell me if you can. You can hear me. Can you see me now? Okay, good. Yay. Good. You guys are all here. I'm so glad. Yay, yay, yay. Okay, wonderful. Um, we're going to go really, really deep today. And it's going to be amazing. Okay. This is so wonderful. Um, so one of the things that I want to tell you, there's, hold on, let me just get organized just a tiny bit here. Oh, um, so, oh gosh, I'm so glad everybody's here. This is wonderful. This is such a good group. And I'm going to dive in a little bit uh, faster, but I know a lot of people are going to miss this part. So maybe Susie and Stacy, you can um, help me with everyone. So today what I'm going to do is if you have not already seen my last video where I talked to you about the north and the south node through the signs, today I'm going to take you through the north and south node through the houses. But what we're going to do is, oh, you guys are so sweet. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, my bangs are new. <laughs> what we're going to do is, um, yeah, get out your scuba gear because we're going to go deep. I'm going to give you guys a little bit deeper than, than what I have found out there. And um, I learned, I have to credit my uh, two teachers, Jan Spiller and Stephen Forrest, for the knowledge that I have on the nodes. And then I'd also like to credit Sue Tompkins for her work on the houses. Um, so, oh, you guys are all so sweet. Oh my God, you guys are just, you just pour out the love and I'm so grateful. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, but this is what I wanna tell you. I want to tell you that what we're going to do is we're going to go through the houses. I'm going to take your south node and I'm going to show you what does it mean when the south node is in the first house, the second house, the third house, and we're going to go all the way around. Now, this is the important part. Okay, good. The important part is, is you do, you really should have the video that I just did. It's the live on the sun through the signs. You should have that inside of you. So if you haven't watched that yet, please go watch that after you watch this one. This is how I want to describe it to you. Um, I'm gonna take the south node and I'm gonna take the south node and I'm gonna put it in every single house. So I will get to your south node. Now, what I want you to do is think about the nodes always run on an axis. So if I'm talking about the south node in the first house, you guys all know that I'm also talking about the North Node in the seventh house. And you know that if I'm talking about the South Node in the second house, you know that I'm talking about the North Node in the eighth house. And if you know that I'm talking about the South Node in the third, I'm talking about the North Node in the ninth. If I'm talking about the South Node in the fourth, then we know that I'm talking about the North Node in the tenth. And if I'm talking about the South Node in the 5th, we know that I'm talking about the North Node in the 11th. And if I'm talking about the South Node in the 6th, we know I'm talking about the North Node in the 12th. So I want you to stick through this, okay, through the whole video, if you have the time and if you can. And then you're probably going to need to go back and re-watch this too, especially if you missed the beginning part, because I'm going to give you this secret formula. Um... So the secret formula is this, okay? And this is what a lot of people don't talk about. The secret formula is 
the house placement of your north node is going to show me the arena, the stage, the sandbox um, in which your karmic contract will be played out. It is the stage. It is the scenery. It is the place in your life that this karma will play out. Now, the sign is how you're going to play it out. So the sign is going to show me how, and the house is going to show me the what. So do you guys get that? Do you guys get that? Tell me that you understand what I'm saying. So you're going to have to take the sign of your south node. Now, just so you know, every single person born um, within 18 months of each other has that same south node so it's really like no big deal every single person that you graduated in in high school with has that same south node what they don't have are the aspects to that south node and they don't have the house that you that you have okay so um <laughs> you guys are so cute love your comments so this is what i want to tell you today we're just going to do the house that's the arena and in honesty, and I'm being really honest with you, the house is actually more important than the sign. Why do I say that? Because everybody born within 18 months has your same, has your same south node. But where it is in your particular chart tells me your karmic contract. It tells me your past trauma, where you were traumatized, and I also believe that we grow ourselves out of strife and out of challenge and out of trauma. So how you have grown your soul. And it also shows me in what arena in this lifetime, that's the house. The house is what arena in this lifetime are you supposed to cultivate? So the arena, the area, the sandbox, the theme, the stage. So what stage, what part of life are you supposed to really grow yourself um and then what we're gonna do is um okay i'm reading your comments what we're gonna do is i'm gonna do a third live and on the third live i'm gonna talk to you about the planetary placements um in relationship or in aspect to the nodal access and so that'll be part three and you won't want to miss that because that's sort of the summation. So the last one, I talked to you about how you're going to do your south node. Because we talked about the sign. This one, we're going to, we're going to talk about what is, the, what is the story of your south and north node? Like what, what arena does it take place? What subject matter are you supposed to be focused on? And then in the next one, the next live, it's not going to be next week. It's probably going to be down the road a little bit. I'm going to talk to you about what about what... Um, what about the the planets in hard aspect and in soft aspect? I'm going to give you a couple examples, though, in this one, just as sort of like a prelude to that video. So remember, the sign is how you're going to do um, your south node and north node. And the houses are what arena you are going to be called into. Um, what area in your life is this going to take place in? So I'm also going to tell you, yeah, and Susie's here and Stacy is here too. So they can answer questions. And thank you both for being here. They're on Team Soul Navigation. If you haven't gotten a reading with either one of them, oh my God, treat yourself. They are amazing, amazing, amazing. Um, okay, so Sue says her and her husband have the same North Node sign and they also have it in the same house. So I wonder if you guys also have the same rising sign. Um, so this is what I want you guys to do. I want you to think of keywords, okay? So how we're going to make it really easy on you is as I talk about these different houses, I want you to think of keywords and you're going to work with me. So anybody who has a question, like if you're going to ask me the question, um, I have Aries North Node in the seventh house. I want you to work with me just a little bit, okay? And I want you to try to take a shot at what you think it means before you ask me the question. So 
I think what it means is something along the lines of, and I want you to try putting the keywords, the keywords of Aries, a couple keywords, leadership, warrior, independent, and what does the seventh house mean, right? Relationships. And so I want you to try to put it together, your own idea of what you think it might mean, and then I'll correct you, or Susie or Stacy will chime in too. But I want you to start trying. I want you to like gamble with me and take a little bit of a risk and stretch and put your guess out there. And all you have to do is think about the keywords. Okay, so are you guys in it? Are you in it with me? We're gonna have fun. We're gonna go deep. It's gonna get really real. So um, the last thing I wanna tell you is um, I'm accepting Super Chat. So if you wanna support my business, my company, I'm so grateful. Uh, you know, no amount is too small, but I really take it to heart when you guys send me a super chat and I really, really appreciate it because it, it, um, every, every little bit helps. And I'm just, I live in gratitude for all of you. The other thing I want to say is, is if you stay to the end, I'm going to tell you the South node placement that most likely never needs to incarnate ever again on earth. And there's one placement, and I'm wondering if I've got somebody, if I know somebody with this placement. I have done tens of thousands of readings for 23 years. I mean, like probably over 300,000 readings. Um, and people ask me all the time, can I do a reading with you? Yeah, that's soulnavigation.com. Come over there and um, book a reading. I I'm booked pretty far in advance, but you can, you can get on one of uh, my readers at Team Soul Navigation, and they can help you with this. And this information is invaluable. When I unlocked the key to my North Node to assist me in, in, in the hardships that my South Node was, was kind of showing up, you know, with the South Node challenges that were showing up in my life, um, it liberated me. And so just doing a reading solely on South Node, North Node, just that alone, is so liberating. It's like 17 years worth of therapy in an hour, and I'm not joking. I think this is the Achilles heel and the North Star, the highest point in the in the chart. I think this is like the single most important thing in a chart. I don't even need to know your sun sign. I can do your whole karmic reading just knowing your nodal axis and where it is. Let me read this. Um, I'm in this to win this. <laughs> you guys are cute. I will keep track of super chat orders and questions. Thank you, Susie. She is a saint. Um, okay, so I want you guys right now to take a look at where your south node is, okay? So uh, this lovely person wrote, I have a north node in Gemini in the 10th house. So then we know that Sarah has uh, Sagittarius in the 4th house as her south node. So pay attention to your south node right now. Everybody find it. Hi, Wit. Hi, Julie Fox. Is there a good place to find the keywords? Um, all my videos? <laughs> Not right now, but um, you could probably Google, you know, what, like keywords for cancer, keywords for Leo. Um, but I'll give you a couple. I love Julie. She loves to learn. Okay, so you guys find your south node, and we're going to start with, okay, good. You guys got it. Okay, good. We're going to start with the first house, okay? Now, listen to this. Still listen, even if you don't have your node here, because whatever planets you have in this house, they're working on this subject matter. So you don't want to just tune into your own thing. So for example, let's say you don't have the South Node in the first house, but let's say you have your Venus or your Mars or your Saturn or your Pluto or your Mercury or your Moon. Well, that's a big house for you. So you wanna know what this house does. And so let's say you have the Moon there. Well, the Moon is going to work on this subject matter that I'm giving you, okay? So you wanna, you wanna listen to every single house that you have a planet in. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so here we go. Um, first I have to say, I'm not a Vedic astrologer. Everybody always asks me, I'm an evolutionary astrologer. What does that mean? That means I believe that the nodes represent reincarnation. If you can't deal with reincarnation, 
that's okay. Substitute the concept of past life to early life, early childhood, okay? Um, and take it from there. But if you do believe in reincarnation, I believe that the South Node shows me your past lives and what you spent many, many lifetimes trying to learn. I also believe that the South Node is where you have had hardship, challenges, and soul trauma, very serious soul trauma. In the next video that I do with you guys on the live, I'm going to show you the aspects to that nodal access, and we're going to be able to see what uh, what kind of challenges um, you actually had. For example, if you have your nodal as your nodal access in an aspect that is easier, let's say trying to Jupiter, you may have had trauma in your life by having too many good things, by inheriting a family business that, um, that stole your self-expression, okay? So there are there is still trauma when you have abundance and when you have positive aspects to the nodal axis. The south node represents not what you need to get rid of, but the space and the place and how you have evolved, how you have grown your character, how you have tended to your wounds, how you have been wounded, how you have suffered, how you have hurt, and how you have overcome those hurts, and how you are overcoming them. Now, anybody here under the age of 36, you may not have your North Node activated yet. The key ingredient to healing the South Node is going to be found in the gifts of the North Node. If you are younger than 36 years old, you may still be dancing in the theme of the South Node. Do not feel bad about that. You're working through it. These things take time. The idea of reincarnation for me and the idea of the South Node and the North Node are to create enlightenment. The goal of the goal of your of your soul's existence is ultimately enlightenment. And I have a really old video from about 2014 on my channel called Enlightenment Part 1 and Enlightenment Part 2. They're like eight minutes each, and it's an old video, but it's still evergreen content, and it's really relevant, and it is like the whole purpose of a soul on earth, like why do we exist and how do we become enlightened? And I teach it to you in eight minutes. So I really recommend that you go dig for that on my channel. You probably have to search kind of hard on my channel. Um, it's one of my first videos that I ever did. So let me just see how you guys are doing over here. Um, Okay, and we will also talk in the third in my third series, we'll talk about the nodal returns. But for now, we're going to jump into the houses. So if you've got your south node in the first house, will you you can write me who does this belong to if you've got your south node in the first house? Um is this anybody? So I'm gonna talk about it and you let me know if this is you. Um, first of all, I want you to take the sign in which your south node is in, and I want you to think of a few, like one, two, or three keywords that describe that sign. So if it's Pisces, that would be empathetic, compassionate, um, altruistic, healing. If it's, if it's Aries, it would be leadership, warrior, right? You guys got this. So, awesome. Um, okay, good. You guys are kind of on board, I hope. So if your south node is in the first house, the arena in your life that you are coming from, you have spent lifetimes as a leader. You have spent lifetimes in an independence from other people. And you had great difficulty learning how to become unified and learning how to do partnership, learning how to maybe even co-create or be in synchronicity with another. You walk to the beat of your own drum. And you became very powerful and very strong and very self-focused. Why? Because you had to. Probably nobody had your back. 
you probably couldn't trust the people around you. You probably were um, attached to people that were weaker than you, maybe not as smart as you, maybe not as capable as you. Anyways, the world was placed on your shoulders. So tell me who has this placement. This is South Node in the first house. Um, the soul's lesson here is going to be found in the North Node in the seventh. And that is to learn. Are you ready? It's really big. And it's no big deal for other people. But it is really big for those who have their south node in the first house. It is to learn how to trust, rely on, and depend on other people. And I guarantee you anybody with a south node in the first house is not super expert at this. And so making commitments to other people in marriage, in partnerships, in, um, in work, and in family, and in life in general. Do I have anybody with a south node in the first house? Well, Lab asks, is it possible to only have a north node? No, it just means whoever designed your chart did not put the south node in there, but the south node is in the exact opposite place to the same exact degree as the north node. And Susie will help you figure out what that is. Um, so, okay, Heather Z, I have the south node in the first house. Great. So this is a lifetime. Um, you have spent many, many incarnations going at it alone, um, feeling very alone with your problems and with your challenges. You probably had to solve your own problems. You probably were not enabled and you probably had to develop a lot of grit and tenacity and will, too much so. I'll tell you that there's trauma in having to go at life alone. Um, and there's also anger inside this. So there's pent up frustration, anger, and, um, uh, how do I want to say this, power, if you will, because, and, and you became highly capable from the trauma of being kind of abandoned, kind of left to your own um, uh, devices, if you will. So for a South Node in the first house, this person, it got as good as they could make it. And if you have a life with no true partnership, um, it's like sitting in a round room all alone by yourself and you're only as smart as, you're only as good as, you're only as capable as you teach yourself. So this is truly a self-made person. Can Heather relate to this? Can Roger relate to this? Um, and it's lonely. Um, so I've got Heather and Roger. Yes, I'm trying to heal all that right now. You're accurate. It's painful. Thank you for that. So the way to heal that is to look is to look at the seventh house and you cannot heal this alone. If you cannot get vulnerable enough to do partnership with another person, you will never heal this. So this is about vulnerability. And you had to spend incarnation after incarnation after incarnation being the opposite of that, invulnerable. Because if you were vulnerable, the whole ship sank. I mean, we're on the Titanic, it's going down, and it's on your back to not let the Titanic go down. And so you're going to save everybody, including yourself. That's exhausting, that's lonely, and that's maddening as hell, right? Um, because you're the most capable person in the room for lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, or the field, or the battleground. And so you are going to be a leader. In this lifetime, you need to learn how to be a collaborator, not necessarily a follower, but a collaborator and it's inside collaboration that you will find true harmony. You will find your highest best self. I want you to think about these people who are um, here to master partnerships and you can tell that um, it helps to be smart. So Malcolm X has this and Malcolm X's whole life is about being a leader and he had to learn how to form alliances and partnerships to get his messaging out. Paul Newman 
You know, Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward, if I have a lot of young people on here, you might not know them, but you probably know Newman's salad dressing. Um, Paul Newman was an Aquarius and he was married to the beautiful Joanne Woodward. And do you know, they spent six months a year apart and Paul went and did his drag racing. He did his films. She did films too. Um, but Joanne said the whole reason why our marriage works is because he's gone six months out of the year. And so he was learning how to do partnership. He was learning how to do collaboration. It was so hard for him, but it is so interesting. He has one of the longest marriages um, in the history of Hollywood. And so I will say, I think Paul really did embrace that by the end of his lifetime. And he did partnership really well with his children um, and with his business partners. Barack Obama also has this South note in the first house. And you can see one of the things he's accused of, not trying to make a political video here, but he was accused of not really being able to embrace the other side, if you will. Um, he was an erudite. So Barack Obama is highly intelligent. And so he would come to those meetings where he's supposed to create partnership, you know, bipartisan deals. And he would be an erudite. He would be, um, and my God, like, go for it. If you're smart, like, let, every, let the world know. But he would kind of speak down to, in a way. And he had to learn to overcome that. He had to learn how to get down on uh, the common man's or the opposite side's level and speak their language to create bonding. And what he even confesses is that his vice president, Joe Biden, did a better job at that collaboration than he did. That's the South known in the first house. They don't want to collaborate because you're kind of too dumb for me to waste my time on you. Not really, but kind of. I don't know if I have any first house South nodes, if you kind of feel like sometimes you're the smartest or most capable in the room. And you don't want to have to rely on people who just don't get it. But you got to get over that. You have to find virtue in other people. And you have to learn trust. Trusting other people is your whole karmic lesson because there was nobody to trust in your last lifetimes. Nobody, not a soul, not your parents. So there's a lot of betrayal with this access. The other person is um, that I had as an example is Richard Nixon. Yeah, and we could see that he didn't really create harmony either. So um, I wanna hear from my first, my first house South noters if you can relate to this um, and give us a little bit of your experience. Second house. So if you've got your south node in the second house, you have your north node in the, in the eighth. Um, okay, they, they're saying yes. So this is the house of resources. And one of the things that bothers me the most, and whenever you hear an astrologer talk about this is the house of money, um, uh, <laughs> it is true. But it's kind of like saying... Um, my house has walls. Yes, my house has walls, but my house also has flooring. It has a ceiling. It has carpet. You know, it has appliances. It has a whole lot of other stuff too. So saying this is the house of money is like saying my house has walls. Um, so who has the south node in the second house? The second house is the house of resources, but it goes way beyond money. And I really give my mentor, Stephen Forrest, credit for expanding the definition of this house, not just for me, but in all of his teaching. Um, this is the soul's relationship to resources. And in previous lifetimes, it left a very, very serious mark on resources. And so they either had too much or too little. And having too much creates, trust me, believe me, I know billionaires. I actually know billionaires. And the sickness that billions of dollars can create in a person is just as ugly as the sickness that poverty can create. So this is a person who didn't have it right with their resources and it eroded their personal worth and their value of themselves. So poverty or excess took a toll on them. And we have to look for, and we're going to do this in the next slide, we have to look at Jupiter, Pluto, Saturn, and Uranus for the answers to know if, if you had too much or too little. What are you afraid of? 
You can, you, you know, you're going to feel your south node for the first 36 years of your life loud. You're going to bring this trauma into this lifetime and you're going to repeat your south node lessons over and over and over and over until you go to the north node. That usually happens after 36 and you start developing your north node. You have to step into your north node to heal these wounds that come from hundreds of lifetimes. Um... Let me see. South node, Gemini, second house. Okay. Sharada X. So she's got this. So tell me if you can relate to this. Sharada, are you my only south node in the second? Um, resources were a problem and they're probably going to be a problem in this lifetime for a little bit until you get your relationship right. So what resources did was it created deep insecurity in you and this is a person who is here to really come to understand their self-worth like what is my value what is my worth so um this person can feel insecure about being able to provide for themselves this person can feel insecure if somebody else is providing for them and now they are dependent on that person and they want to break, break away and they want to do it for themselves, but they can't get out of the entanglement. This person could have a life completely carte blanche paid for, but what do you have to do for that life to be paid for? Look at Paris Hilton, right? Yeah, she has her whole life paid for, but look at the things she had to do, the obedience and how she had to give up her identity in a way to uh, in, to rightfully inherit this money. She had to do the theme of her parents, whatever her parents or whoever was foot in the bill said she had to do. So the second house is about literally finding your self-worth. And um, let me see. So... It could have been somebody who had too much money that came with too many expectations and it left the person paralyzed and incapacitated in a way, not being able to speak up. Um, it could also have been um, a lack of resources or a lack of money, a lack of education, a lack of a home like Jewel. She had to sleep in her car, you know, maybe having your home torn away from you, living in severe poverty. It could also be somebody who has eating disorders or who had a negative relationship to food. Either there was too much food or there was too little food. This can be a starvation aspect too. So if you have an awkward relationship with food, you probably were either starved in a last lifetime or you got to eat like a feast while other people perished. Um, but the, this is also something where you may have inherited your family business or you may have been expected to do due diligence with your family business when you didn't want to, when it wasn't in alignment with your truth. And so you just worked a mundane job because you inherited it and you were obligated to it. Um, but I'll tell you what happened and I'll tell you how you can see it in this lifetime. This person had their power removed. They had their power removed because of either the lack of or too many resources. So this is a person who, okay, so Kimmy Moore says, I have South Node in the second house of Taurus, and I had an eating disorder. Exactly. This is where you will find eating disorders. This is where you will find funky relationships to food. Eating too much, bulimia, throwing it up, or not eating at all. Um, and this is, uh, the, the South Node is going to be the trauma. And understanding the trauma is really important so you can heal it. So what does the South Node person need to do? The key lies in the eighth house. Being unafraid of going deep, deep, deep in, down to the bowels of doing your deepest internal work. Healing those old wounds of feeling inferior, inadequate, not worth it, not good enough, not rich enough, not pretty enough, not smart enough, not whatever enough, not whatever enough. South note in the second does not feel good enough. 
because their power was squashed, stolen, or taken away in their past lifetimes. So they're in this lifetime and they have got to go down deep and create intimacy with themselves and with others that they can trust. Um, and how you do that, again, the key is in vulnerability, is to expose those wounds to self and to others, to be seen and truly accepted by another, finding and building and transforming the power within you into a greatness to know and love thyself, going deep. The eighth house is one of the most powerful houses in the Zodiac. Let me give you two people to flush this out so you can see how powerful, great human beings suffered such deep insecurity, so much so it cost them both their life. Are you guys ready for these two examples? Princess Diana, she had no idea what her worth was. And guess what happened? She joined the monarchy and guess what they did? They stole her freaking power. They stole all of it. They stole it to her death. So that's what I'm talking about where you might've had too much, too much of a good thing. Like who doesn't want to be a princess, right? Not me. And um, she was eclipsed. And the second one is on the opposite end of the spectrum, who has this placement? I mean, this placement is so, so deep because you come with gargantuan eighth house power, north node in the eighth house, and you don't even know it. Praying to God by the time you're 36 years old, you get it. And I think Princess Diana, when she broke away from the monarchy, she finally knew she was a powerful person, but then she didn't know how to use it. Um, and then it ultimately killed her. Can you guys see this? Can you relate to it? The second one is Kurt Cobain. Here he is, a powerhouse, powerhouse artist, changed changed the whole entire music industry. That's how powerful he was. Um, and one of my best friends was his best friend. And she went, she went with him um, to his very first Saturday Night Live. She went with him as a regular human being. He was born here in Aberdeen, Washington, small teeny weeny podunk town. He goes to Saturday Night Live with my good, good friend, one of my very best friends in life. And she came back and he was a god. He turned into a god overnight. They went to the Seattle airport, landed after Saturday Night Live. And, and he, you know, he, he poofed into a world he didn't even recognize because he didn't see himself as a god. He had a second house, South Node. He was insecure about who he was. So Kurt Cobain and Princess Diana, that's how powerful this placement is. Um, okay, good. You guys are all talking. I love it. So does anybody have the South Node in the third house? This, this one is very interesting. Um, Oh, good. Stacy's here answering questions. So Susie, I'm so grateful. So the third house, the South Node in the third house. This person has kind of a manic quality to them. Tell me if you have this aspect. This person is in perpetual motion. And this person had to, I would say, even be a little bit shifty or crafty. You know, they had to shift gears, be in perpetual motion. Um, I think of this house as the runaway house. Um, where the person has to master the craft of wit and communication and probably had to talk themselves out of trouble all the time. Um, but it's communication without intimacy. It's communication without kind of soul. It's like just the facts. It's cunning and clever. It's a fox house, the foxy house, if you will, because it's crafty and clever and um, it has to think quickly on their feet. So this is going to be where there was great trauma, if you will, around communication. This is the arena. This is the sandbox of communication and um, also learning and education and siblings. So they had to rely on impulsiveness and they had to make life up as they went because life was not stable, predictable or steady. They had to go with no plan. It's almost like how I saw those Syrian refugees 
carry their suitcase and their kid in their hand, and they're just walking towards the German border. They have no idea what's there. They're making it up as they go. And then they get thwarted, and then they have to live out in a tent for two years, and then they get to go, and then they need a visa, and then they don't. So it's like day by day. You try living like that. That's painful, right? Does anybody have this? No, I'm on the third house. South node Leo third. Okay, this is Jan. And so this is... Um, this can be painful because in your past life, you had to live day by day and maybe even hour by hour. Um, and you probably were very crafty and smart, believed in education, but somehow education using your, your, your voice, your voice was your tool. It probably saved you and it probably got you into a ton of trouble. So you probably talked too much. You might have told the secrets that you shouldn't have told. You might have overexpressed. And you may have been overthinking. You also probably were betrayed or hurt by your siblings and or your, your um, cousins of some sort. And the key in this lies about, oh, Jan was talking about her friend. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm on the third house. Do I have anybody here? Okay. Oh, Mel. Mel has this in the third house. So Mel, you'll have to tell me if you can relate to this. The key in this lies in learning, developing a meaning for your life, creating a long-term goal and plan, um, and building a sincere truth and belief system in which you are willing to devote your life by. It's almost like if you have your south node in the third house, you were sort of feeling like you had a, you were a meaningless wanderer. You know, maybe you were looking for a loaf of bread and you just had to go here and here to steal it. Um, you're very scattered and you um, have to chameleon yourself, make it up on the fly. And there's no real stability. And there's a manic compulsion with this in perpetual movement and motion and thinking. The mind never shuts off. Um, there's a desire to really learn, but maybe learning was thwarted. Um, maybe you weren't allowed to learn. So the key is, thank you, Jan. The key here is learning and developing and believing in a truth or a religion or a philosophical belief system in which you are loyal to. Developing your higher mind is the key. Your higher self comes with a mind that makes meaning out of your truth. Um, this is a person who needs to get out of the mundane little rat race, gerbil on the wheel, just spinning on the wheel, going nowhere, going nowhere fast, doing a bunch of data, but it doesn't make any sense and it doesn't ever add up. So this is a, the key to this trauma, healing this soul's past incarnations is to create a mission with a big, grand, giant, important, global vision and goal and doing it. Getting out of the weeds and into the development of the meaning of your existence and living from that perspective and point of view every single day. Make your life have meaning and, and be loyal to it. And don't sabotage it by doing a you know, by sticking your finger in a thousand honey pots, do one or two things that represent your belief system well. Does that make sense? Okay, number four, the fourth house. Um, this is somebody who had serious karma. By the way, you guys all picked your lifetimes. I just want you to know, this is not God doing this to you. You wanted to learn these lessons. You wanted to free yourself from your south node in some way, shape, or form. The other thing is I want to tell you, your gifts came from your south node. Your gifts came from and are coming from in this lifetime, growing yourself from those challenges. And so you're going to find, like in the third house, the overthinking, you're going to find that you're a brilliant communicator and you also talk too much right? In the, in the first house, your south node in the first house, you're going to find you're a brilliant leader, but you're too damn bossy, right? So the very, your, your vice is your virtue. 
So I don't want you to think that the South Node is some terrible thing, but I do want you to know that this is the place, the space, the arena, which you're going to grow your, your, your gifts out of. And so these are your gifts too. And I want you to see your South Node and bless your South Node uh, as a gift. I live, uh, my, my whole life is built on my South Node. And I, I love it. I make sure though that I do my North Node. Um, and it's really important, but I do see my South Node in its gifts. It was also really traumatizing too, but I wouldn't be able to do my gifts and do my South Node well had I not gotten honest about the challenges and the pain and the suffering and the trauma that it also created, right? Are you guys with me? So when astrologers say the South Node is something to get rid of, it really isn't something to get rid of. It's something to integrate and it's something to be aware of. And it's something to work on. Okay, good. You guys are good. So, yeah, I'm on the fourth house now. <laughs> you guys are sweet. Yes, Jan. The answer to that is yes. Um, the fourth house. This is really serious karma with your family. Um, with your lineage, with your heritage, with your tribe, with your culture. So think about that for a minute. Think about when we were living in tribes and think about what if that tribe did not accept you or want you? What if you couldn't relate to that tribe's way of life? What if you were advanced and beyond that tribe, but you had to adhere to customs and culture of that tribe, right? Um, and we can still see it today. You still see a progressive child born to a conservative family and they want to break away. That is painful stuff. So that is the fourth house south node. Family did them in. Family did them in. They could have been too loyal to a family whose belief system was god awful. What if you were born into a family of Nazis in Germany, right? But you knew the truth, but you were one of the few that knew the truth that the Jews were good people too. And you had to live with that family and you were disgusted or repulsed, right? And you had to adhere and you were loyal to them, but you hated them. That's the South Node in the fourth. You could have also idolized a terrible family. What if you idolized your father and he was the mob boss of New York City and killed people for a living and you didn't know? So family got twisted here and there's deep loyalty and there's deep bonds with family that became a burden. Somehow your family betrayed you or burdened you in a way, enslaved you, stifled you, took away your own personal identity. And um, you uh, probably had to live collectively in, in a bond maybe that you didn't want. What if your, your father, right, God forbid, but took advantage of you every single night and you couldn't speak up and you were enslaved in that. And you had to show up at dinner and eat a meal with him pretending to your mom that everything was just a-okay. That's this fourth house. That's how this fourth house can be so sick. Um, so Manuel, I don't know if you can relate, but I want you to tell me if you can. And, um, You guys are so sweet. Um, but what I want to tell you is the key is the 10th house. So, so in the 10th house, you are supposed to individuate away from your family, um, at least balance them in a way that is intimate and sincere and real and works well for you. But put your mark into the world. Put your mark on the world show your talents off, leave a legacy behind that means something that is your, that is yours, not your family's, not what your family wanted from you, but yours. And most of all, don't hide. Don't bury yourself, don't hide, and do not become ensconced or enslaved or over attached to the obligations that your family puts on you. The other thing I want to say is that this South Node can idolize the family so much 
that they can't, um, sometimes they can't find their own power and they are eclipsed by superstar parents. Let me give you three examples of people who have this placement. And it would be interesting to go and read their autobiographies. And if you guys know these people or know anything about them personally, let me know. Oh, thank you for the super chats. I'm going to try to get to them all. So I love that Jen Yea, and I'd love to know how old you are, Jen Yea M, asks me, so is the South Node bad or is it good? <laughs> well, I love that you're on my channel because a lot of astrologers will talk and speak in terms of good and bad. But, and I want to know how old you are, um, because it kind of matters um, in the way I want to answer this question. And what I have learned is that really in life, everything is good and everything is bad. Money is good and money is bad. Beauty is good and beauty is bad, right? It's a blend. It's an intricate dance. It's how you do money makes it good or bad. How you work with beauty makes it good or bad, right? So I don't believe in good and bad. I am 14. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, please. Oh my God. Give Jenea a big hi and a, an emoji. Please put an emoji down for this beautiful 14 year old on this channel, sitting here learning with us. I have chills. What a gorgeous soul you are. And I love that question so much, especially because you're 14 years old. So one of the things you're going to find out is that life really is not good or bad. Aspects are not good or bad. It's not good to be a Sag and bad to be a Scorpio. There's good and bad in all things. And all things can be both things. And you're going to learn that the Truth about life, my sweet, sweetheart. Yes, everybody say hi to her. She's amazing, 14 years old. I'm just so excited. Um, you're my daughter's age. But what you're going to learn is that life is nuanced. It is both things all the time. And it's filled with contradiction. And it is never just one way, good or bad. So the South Node does have hard stuff in it, but it's out of that hard stuff that you grow the best pieces of you. It's out of your challenges that you will be triumphant. And you can't be triumphant if you have suffered nothing, right? So you need a little bit of suffering in order to put in some meat into the game to, to find your highest best self. So you can't do life without sort of the challenges, the trauma, the torture that comes with that South Node. Because we don't get to be Hussein Bolt. He's the fastest runner in the world, although I think somebody might have beat his record. We don't get to be the fastest runner in the world, right? Without getting a blister, without having our joints ache, without having a workout that hurts, without getting crushed at some point, right? So is that bad or good? It's nuanced. So I love that question, and it's a great reminder. And for a 14-year-old to have the guts to even learn this stuff and then ask a question, ah, oh, look at all those emojis you got. I love it. And thank you for this wonderful channel for pouring the love on these young people. And I mean, oh, it almost makes me cry. I wish I had this at 14. I did not have this at 14. Um, yeah, you guys are so sweet. Thank you for, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> Jen, yeah, yeah. Where was I? Where was I? I'm trying to find my place. Oh, oh, the three people, Julia Roberts. She has her South Node in the fourth house, Robert Redford and Christian Dior. So we have to go back and look and see if they had traumatic childhoods or if being in their family was hard. Um, I don't know their personal life stories, but if anybody does. By the way, I'm not drinking wine. I'm drinking Gatorade. And also, I want to tell you, you guys, if you don't have your gorgeous natal 
chart from me. Oh my gosh, it's $10. Go buy one or be a super supporter and get one for free. And then you get all my secret videos and you get so many perks. I, I give you your horoscope for 365 days for the whole year. And it's personal. It's not just like, oh, the sun went into Leo today. You're going to have a good day. No, it's based on your chart, your aspects. It's so deep and you get that in I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who is a super supporter. There's so many of you and I'm so grateful. And then you get all my videos behind the scenes. And I want to tell you, I want to tell you something. So tell me super supporters if you want this. Um, <laughs> I want to tell you Susie's on it. Okay. Thanks, Susie. I need you to like bounce, bounce some people for me. I got Susie on it. Um, yeah, she's so on it. She, <laughs> thank you. Um, I usually don't find mean people, but once in a while I get people that are mean. I don't know why. I don't, I have no idea. It's rare. It's okay. It's okay. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, I was going to tell you for my super supporters, I want to have, um, a happy hour. I don't know what time we would have this happy hour, but I kind of want to throw a party for you on Zoom, and I want to know if you'd like to come. I probably have to charge a small fee, like $10, but um, I want to have a happy hour where we can go deep on a subject, and I can just answer questions, and I would send out a private invitation to all of my super supporters, and I'm thinking about doing it maybe in early September, but I'll give you a lot of notice so you could mark it on your calendar, but let me know if that is something that you would like to do. And I know I'm not going to be able to accommodate all time zones, but um, hopefully, hopefully you guys would be able to come. And um, that's one idea that I'm turning around in my head for my supers because I just want to say thank you. Um, okay. Re-Evolution Tarot asked me, am I a Libra? No, I'm not a Libra, but I do have two of my most personal planets in Libra. So you're not seeing it incorrectly, but no, I'm not a Libra. Um, so let's talk about the fifth house. If your south node is, um, <laughs> okay, good. You guys are cute. Yeah, bring your, bring your happy hour drink. And yeah, let me know if you super supporters would like to come. And if you're not a super supporter, come be one and I'll invite you and you'll get your gorgeous natal chart and you'll get your 365 horoscope and you get your deep dive natal. Um, okay, so let's do the fifth house south node. So this is interesting. If you have a fifth house south node, there is a very good chance that you reigned supreme in your last lifetime. And um, I'll just tell you how much fun was it to be a king or a queen in uh, 500 in the year 500 or in the year 1500, right? Or how about this, 2021? <laughs> Look at, you know, Prince Harry. Is it fun? Yeah, Princess Diana, how fun is it to be royalty? Um, and so oftentimes people with the South Node in the fifth house, they were royalty in some way. They were in a powerful position. They ruled, they commanded, they were the king, the queen, they were in charge. Now, maybe you were just a princess, but somehow people bowed down to you. And then one day, guess what happened? They no longer did. And that is the saddest day, right? Because it's very hard for these people to not get their way. They come in with a confidence from lifetimes of being regal or royal, and they're uh, and, and I'll just tell you that um, there was a lot of success in this, it, with, with this placement. There was a lot of success usually, and then there wasn't. So you could have been Princess Diana where, you know, wow, I get to be this princess. And then you realize, ooh, I have to be this princess. So this is very, very painful. Um, <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Thank you, April. I appreciate you. And so I want to know if I have any fifth house, if you can feel kind of this royalty in you. And I don't mean it in that you, you know, that you're a jerk or you're, you know, you're just arrogant ass in this lifetime. I don't mean that. But these people usually feel that there is a specialness inside of them and that there's a commanding presence inside of them. Um, now, I'll tell you that they could have been traumatized by that. 
They may had to have made heinous decisions by being in charge of people who were below them and those decisions could have tormented them. Um, and they also may have really struggled with children. And I'll tell it to you this way. If you were a queen or a princess um, and you did not have a baby boy, you were shunned. Um, and so, or if you couldn't get pregnant, I want you to think of this as sort of the Anne Boleyn placement where, wow, she's this French courtesan who got to marry King Henry VIII. Whoa. Ah, the most powerful man in all of Europe and maybe the world at the time, only to be, you know, <laughs> sent to the tower and have her head chopped off. So I'm not saying that that necessarily happened to you but I am talking about how the world was so in love with you until they weren't. And so also this is, um, so Gail, you'll have to tell me if you feel this. Also these people probably, and this can happen in this lifetime too, up until 36, where there's an issue around children. Either you've had a very difficult child or you had a very difficult childbirth or you didn't get the kind of child that you want. Maybe you had a special needs kid. Um, that requires more from you. God, God bless you. Um, not that's a bad thing. I'm just saying maybe the children's story didn't work out. Maybe you inherited stepchildren that are mean to you. Maybe you adopted and you wanted to have your own. Maybe you wanted a girl and you had all boys. Um, maybe you had three miscarriages. Maybe you had to bury a child. Maybe you lost a child. Maybe you lost children. And so somehow children or having children or conception was very, very difficult. And it may have created very serious trauma in a last lifetime. And so maybe in this lifetime, you're just like, I don't even want children. Um, so I also want to tell you that, let's say you were Anne Boleyn, or you were a courtesan, or you were a queen. Well, there is no room for creativity. If you are a queen, you are by the book. I mean, look at Queen Elizabeth right now. You do it by the book. And and, and look at Meghan Markle, she's a Leo, the creative, creative, creative. There's no room for creativity. You do it the way we tell you to do it and you do not make up, all creativity is, is I'm going to, it is going to be my creation. There is no me or my, or my creation, my self-expression when I am the queen. There isn't, I have to do it the way it has been done for hundreds of years. I have to do the protocol. I am here with the orthodox protocol, right? And so these people got their creativity stolen from them. They had no right for a unique self-expression. There's no uniqueness here, no. I mean, maybe you could pick the embroidery on your dress, maybe, but you cannot wear the wrong color to the wrong event. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, you don't get to wear black at a wedding if you want to. You don't get to color your hair. You don't get to do creative things. So your creativity was massively shut down. And there was also with this placement, this fifth house is a big house. It's a giant house. It's the house of joy. Basically, what I can tell you is that joy was illegal. Love affairs were illegal. Falling madly in love was not right. You needed to be prudent. So your south node in the fifth house could have also meant that, meant that you were not prudent. Maybe you were growing up in the Victorian era, but you were a stripper or you worked in the red light district. And so you, guess what, were shunned, right? So it could also go that way. And we need to look at Jupiter and we've got to look at Mars and Venus to see what role did this play? Were you a courtesan? Were you... Were you a prostitute at a time that that was just, oh my God, you horrible person, right? So this one gets really twisted. Yeah, this does sound like Brittany. I'd love to, Susie, can you look up and tell me where's Brittany's South Node? I dreamed of Brittany all last night. Oh my God, my heart just breaks for Brittany. Um, she's not allowed to have her own self-expression. I want to see where her South Node is. What did Gail say? I couldn't have children. There you go. She has South Node in fifth house. Woo, that gave me chills. And so we do need to be gentle when we talk about the South Node because what we're doing is we're pushing on the person's Adam apple. We're on the Achilles heel. We are on the tender spot. The South Node comes with pain, but like our 14 year old wise, our wise one, Jamala said, is it good or bad? It's both. You probably grew yourself tremendously out of that. But 
fifth house south nodes do not do very well not getting their way. I'm just going to be honest with you. So here's the key to the south node in the fifth house. You got to go to the 11th. And so you got to go way beyond your own self, way beyond your own story, way, way, way beyond me, me, and me, and me, and me, and me, and the way I see things. And you have to go into, you have to go into the space that goes way beyond self and into the collective and into a humanitarian perspective. So maybe Gail not being able to have children, maybe the healing comes through working with children that are not her own, that then she helps to heal or in some capacity that is bigger than having a child, right? Um, but to develop goals that benefit the collective, not just the self. And to get your relationship right with children in the world and to develop more reciprocity in friendship, to also develop the intellect. The 11th house is so bright. It is so brilliant. If you guys watched my top three most intelligent signs, you know that I chose the number one most intelligent sign to be Aquarius. So to develop beyond just passion, right, and drive, an intellectual analytical ability to help advance society society to break out of the old systems and structures and to create new systems and structures to be creative for the collective like the girl who is on a paddleboard and a hot pink bikini cleaning up plastic in the Australian ocean who's that girl she built a whole company out of it and now they're all out there in their swimsuits and they're picking up plastic bottles and then, I don't know, they're making blankets out of it or something. Um, that's pretty darn cool. Going beyond the self and into the collective, being creative um, and finding self-worth through, through advancing society um, on a larger scale. It's almost like play bigger than what's just in it for me. And I'm sure you do. Um, that is a harsh placement. It's, it's a very hard placement. Wow. Five plus. Okay. So April's talking about that. Um, this gives me Marie Antoinette vibes. Rana says, yeah, I think that's a good one. I did Marie Antoinette have children. She was very selfish, wasn't she? I don't know. That would be an interesting one, too. Did Susie, did Susie say, um, oh, my God, is that Britney Spears, Susie? South node in the fourth in Capricorn, is that Britney Spears? Because if that's true, go back and rewind and look at what I said about being enslaved into your family. I don't know if that's Susie's answer for me. Um, okay, let's go into the sixth house. And <laughs> Linda Lee, I love that. Um, you have to do the best to the worst nodes. Jan says, yes. So that's Brittany's placement. Well, doesn't that make total sense? I mean, I'm telling you guys, when you really understand the story of the person's south node, you see so deep inside their soul. You don't even need to know what their sun sign is. Their sun sign is almost irrelevant. Do you know in almost all my videos, I'm like, we don't do sun sign astrology. No, I can do a whole two hours just talking about your nodal access. Um, Marie Antoinette loved her children. Susie says yes. Oh, wow. Yes, that's Brittany. So that just breaks my heart. And and what she needs to do, she has to stay in the 10th. She has to find her worth through her own self-expression. And she did for so long. I will tell you, it is my prediction that she will break free and she will become her own person and the world will celebrate her. I really do. I just got chills saying that. Um, okay, the sixth house. Ah, KB, thank you. I'm so glad you're here. 
consider being a super supporter. I would love to have you. Um, and yeah, go back to the beginning because I do talk about the, the complexity of you need to know the sign, you need to know the house, um, the house of the south node. And then in our next live, I'm going to do uh, the aspects. So in the sixth house, this is the house of duty. Now, you could have been a former slave or servant to routine. You could have been just a genuine slave um, to someone or something in your past lifetimes. But you were bound by obedience and you were owned by a master. Now, that might not be, um, you know, slavery as as we know it today. You The master could be something other than, you know, a human, you know, a white male Caucasian plantation owner in Virginia. It might not look like that. But you were a slave to something. Maybe you were a slave to a to a cult master. Maybe you were a slave to Scientology. I don't know. I don't know when Scientology was born. Maybe you were a slave to a system, to a school, to a predator, to uh, a family business. Um, but I will tell you what happened here. And, and this is where your North Node is going to be in the 12th. At some point, you were so self-sacrificing that you literally dissolved your own ego. That's how sad this is. And you have to get, get beyond the compulsion to work your butt off on the gerbil wheel, being a slave to some master. The master could be in your own head. Like, I got to be good enough. I got to get straight A's. I got to be... You know, I got to go to Harvard. I got to go to Oxford. I got to go to Cambridge. Oh, my God, I'm not good enough. That could be the slave. Um, but you you have to get beyond the obedience to the to the to the master that you have um, and surrender the compulsion to work to prove my worth. These people work to prove their worth and learn to surrender to a higher power. And this is um, also, and this is going to sound crazy. Anybody who, okay, so wait a minute. Somebody has this. I just saw it. Jim B, sixth house in Leo, south node. Tell me, tell me if this sounds crazy to you. And maybe it doesn't. Maybe you're, is this my friend Jim? Is this my palmist Jim? I don't know if this is. If this is my palmist Jim, it, he's already doing his north node. So I already know he is. But go back to childhood, okay? Okay. Um, if that's you, because I know you and I love you. Um, but anybody who has the sixth and serenity journey, sixth house, south node and Taurus. Okay, tell me if this is true. Where you really need to, and tell me how old you guys are. You need to come to a place that you can literally develop a relationship with and trust in miracles. And I know that sounds crazy, um, but believing, oh, Stacy has this. I think Stacy would agree with this. Um, no, this isn't, but hi, Jim V. Okay, well, tell me if you can do this and tell me how old you are. But literally having a relationship with miracles, like believing in, like truthfully believing in miracles. Because if you have your south node in the sixth house, this is the last thing you ever believed in. You believed in um, good deeds come from hard work. Good people are hard workers. If I work, I'm worth something. There are no miracles. You are what you make of yourself, you know. Um, and you never rested your laurels on any miracle that's going to poof down from the sky. And I also want to say that this placement, you're really being asked to manage anxiety and insecurity by developing a broader faith in a power, in a higher octave, in a higher vibrational power than your own self. You're not just, you're not just as good as the Excel spreadsheet that you did and turned in for your boss. Um, serenity journey, always been working to prove my worth and it hasn't worked out well for me. How old are you? Oh, 45, thank you. You already answered the question. 45, okay, time to stop that. <laughs> Um, because life is so much bigger than, than just work and Kiwi here at sixth house in Aries. Yeah. So like a real, a real leader around work. 
um, and a sixth house Mars. So you probably, Cole, can relate to this. Um, <laughs> Astro tap, that's cute. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're so cute. Um, and hey, hey, over there in the UK. I love my UKers. Um, so learning, I think, self love and universal love and unconditional love by accepting your flaws and releasing the critical nature that you have about yourself is the master key to this placement. Now, so that sounds yippee yahoo. Okay, self-love. All right. Oh, I love myself. Oh, you know, learning unconditional love. I love my flaws. Blah. You know, no, this is so deep. <laughs> this takes lifetimes to do, lifetimes, lifetimes. And you've been trapped in a critical concept of self. If you have sixth house placements, you have critical, critical, like negative, critical, negative self-talk concepts of yourself. And we've got to move to the 12th house where you are loved like God loves you. So find the person in the world that loves you the very most and loves you the best. It loves you the best in the sense of they love you the way that you want to be loved and hang out more with them and talk to them. Um, okay, and Stacy, my beautiful Stacy from Team Soul Navigation uh, says, absolutely, I would agree with you. <laughs> we love the yellow. Thank you. <laughs> South Node 6th House Kiwi says, spreadsheets, you called me out. <laughs> Uh, I believe in miracles. I just tuned in. I love it. That's so great. Okay, the seventh house, south node. Um, in a prior lifetime, you know, you were a person who merged so deeply with other people that you created codependency. And that's a little bit of a word that people use a lot, but they don't really know what it means. It means that you merged so deeply into somebody else's agenda, you, you kind of lost your own. Um, and that you didn't know yourself uh, except in relationship to another. So I'll tell you a little secret story. So when I was a young girl, I grew up with next door neighbors that sort of became my aunt and uncle. And I love them dearly. And I just like was a latchkey kid. So I grew up over at their house. And the dad was a powerhouse. He was Aquarius powerhouse. And he just ran the show. He had a family business and his wife was a housewife. And um it was just her job and her duty to make sure her husband was comfortable. And she made sure we all were. She made the best chocolate milkshakes and she, gosh, the best popcorn. I found out years later, the reason why her popcorn was so good is because she used two full sticks of butter. <laughs> two, <laughs> not a quarter like I do, but two full sticks of butter. No wonder why I was there in third grade eating that popcorn. Anyways, her whole life was just in service to her husband and to her kids, basically. And um, she really had no identity. She really had nothing. And she, uh, she became a severe alcoholic. And I loved her dearly, uh, dearly. I mean, she basically raised me because my parents were, if you guys watch my private videos, you know, my parents were just on their career track. Um, but she became an alcoholic, and by about 4.30 in the afternoon, you couldn't even understand what she was talking about because and I didn't know. I was young. I was nine years old. I didn't know alcohol. I didn't have any relationship with alcohol at that point. But anyway, she had no identity except to be in service to creating harmony and being in relationship with her husband, and she didn't know who she was except his wife. Um, and so it sounds a little bit like the sixth house, but there was real codependency because it really was, uh, in relationship to her husband and the marriage and holding that marriage together. And she lost her life by falling through a glass coffee table, being too drunk. She lost herself completely, completely lost herself. Um, and she, he, he already died. And so after he died, she had nothing. She had not one thing to live for. She didn't have anybody to make buttered popcorn for or have appetizers laid out. And it just uh, bro bro breaks my heart. But when you are codependent, you have no purpose without the other person. And 
And when that codependency is so deep, your own kids don't really even matter. You know, other people don't matter. You don't have friendships that go beyond that relationship. And so her own individuated self was never found, never cultivated, never expressed. It was never seen. It was never wanted. Try that on. It was never wanted. Never wanted. Never desired. That's sad. So codependency is the south node in the seventh. Be very careful. If you are overattached to just one person in your life and you have a south node in the seventh, go make some friends. Get attached to multiple people and really, really disengage from that person a little bit enough to cultivate your own opinions. Speak freely. Say no. Talk about what you don't agree with. Create discord. Create challenge. Be a leader. Um, you're going to have your north node in the first house. And yes, you need to build healthy relationships with one another. But you need new relationships that allow for individuated self-expression. And autonomy creates healthiness. You've got to find the power in your own life, in your own heart. Um, be gutsy enough to be yourself. So the key is in the first house. You've got to know your own truth. So you've got to discover your own truth. So you've got to dig for your own truth. And you have to dig for your true self and then you have to let that be revealed and then take all your actions throughout your day based on your true self. That's how you start becoming a leader in your own life. And you have to develop fairer relationships, fairer, more fair. So the relationship benefits you and the relationship also benefits them. And you have to learn it's okay to not always be nice. It's called tough love. You have to learn tough love. And you have to also learn that self-validation is equally as important as validation from others. Developing boundaries and saying no is the absolute critical thing here. Mastering, mastering self-empowerment, power inside of your own self, is the karmic game here. Do I have any north node in the first house, south node in the seventh? Oh, Jenea, that's my, that's my girl. She says, that's very accurate for me. And I have Pisces in the seventh. Okay, well, that is really hard. So I'm glad you're 14 and you're learning this. Be willing to say no to your peers. This is what I want to say, because I know you're 14 years old. This is the time in your life where peer pressure is going to be magnified. It's going to be like at 10,000%. And I want you to start practicing by just saying, no, thank you. That's not for me. You know, when it isn't. Like, hey, do you want to sit here with us at lunch? Oh, no, thank you. I'm going to go over there. You know, just practice no. Practice no. It's so scary how true this is, Jenea says. Yeah, well, you're 14. you got a long, long time to learn this. But um, I want you to start practicing no. And don't do a damn thing you don't want to do, especially if it compromises you, my sweet, sweet heart. Um, Okay, so Colleen McBride kind of understands. And Bethany, yeah. And you don't want to create that codependency. Um, you also, I would say, get a job. You know, for anybody who has this placement, get a job that puts you into a leadership position fast. Like, um, you know, something that puts you on the front line with people so you can practice saying no. So I got a lot of South Node seventh houses. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. I know, right? Um, it's hard to say no. Start practicing it. You have to practice the art of no. And I always, I always teach my Libras and my South Node in the sevenths, you know, the cheese sandwich. So you have a piece of bread, then you have the cheese, and then you have a piece of bread. So let's say, um, I don't know, let's say you, you're asking me uh, if I want to go to dinner tonight with you. And I really don't want to go to dinner with you, but I don't want to hurt your feelings. And I feel kind of obligated to go to dinner with you. I would say the cheese sandwich, 
is affirm the person, adore the person, admire the person. Then you say no, then you affirm, adore, and admire. So it goes like this. Oh, that is really sweet of you. Thank you for thinking of me. Um, that That's so nice. I don't really have the time tonight, um, and I'm kind of busy for this whole month of July, but when I get back from whatever, my travels, um, I might be able to do that. It would be nice to hang out with you. I just told you flat out no. That's what no sounds like. Okay, so that's your seventh house south node no. <laughs> Koki the gem and I wolf, haha. <laughs> As a bartender, it's hard to say no. Yeah, I can imagine. Like, you know what? I think it's probably in your best interest. You know, just want to take care of you. Just kind of noticing you've had a little bit too much. Um, probably better to come back tomorrow night. I just told you no. I just told you no. I'm not serving you another Corona. <laughs> you guys are cute. Okay, the eighth house. Um, in past lives... This one's really big, okay? I told you that the 8th house is a powerhouse. It is. If you have a lot of planets in the 8th house, you come with a tremendous amount of power in this lifetime. So in your past lives, you aligned yourself with people with power. And I'm talking intense freaking power. And you probably were second in command. You were in alliance with power. And you knew all the drama and all the goings-ons. This is a seriously psychic house as well. And you learned how to make yourself invaluable, an invaluable and, and powerful soulmate. And you probably became the psychotherapist to the person in charge. And there's an intense merging with other people at the deepest, deepest, deepest level. And um, it probably also caused you to have to let go of your own needs in order to serve this person in power. And there's a lot of betrayal with the eighth house. So betrayal was the weapon used against you. So if you have your south node in the eighth house, I'm pretty sure you have experienced very deep betrayal in this lifetime. People that were supposed to be good to you turned on you. And, um, you know, so... This is also somebody who comes in with deep psychic power. So if you have your South Node in the 8th house, tell me if you feel like you're really intuitive and you have x-ray vision and you are psychic in some way. So in their last lifetime, it was a little bit dangerous to know so much. So they learned to hide the psychic sense. And now they hide big pieces of themselves. They're very private. South Node in the 8th house. They're very, very, very private. This is also the house of death. So somebody was probably killed or you dealt with the dying, the deaths, um, the wounded that died. Um, and, you know, killing, uh, you were either killed or killed, had to kill to survive. Um, so crucial Diablo, tell me if you can relate to any of this. Um, and, and also there's like a visceral feeling here of knowing more than people either think you do or knowing more than you should or feel comfortable with, knowing secrets. It's like you've got the secret scoop on everyone. And the other thing is, is that you were in alliance to this powerhouse. Um, and it this, this powerhouse probably created security for you. Um, with their resources. And so you probably needed to align yourself with somebody in this more powerful position for food, for sh shelter, for social or financial uh, gain. And it probably cost you. And it may have cost you money. It may have cost you sex. It may have cost you things that are unthinkable. Um, um, and... This is also a house that gets really, really, really in your face real. Like they cannot deal with superficiality. This is the deepest house other than the 12th, but I think the 8th is even deeper. This is the deepest house in the whole zodiac. When I say deep, this is down in the bowels. 
So this is where you see the ugliest of ugly. And um, they had a relationship with this and it was unbearable. Um, these people probably had a tortured previous life in some way. And so they can deal with a great deal of pain. The key in this lifetime is to build their own security within their own money, their own resources, their own work, and not needing to align with others in order to find power, but to find self-esteem, self-worth, and personal power that is so deep that they are now the number uno. They are not the sidekick. They're not the helper. They are the person who has the great power, not in need of somebody else's investment in them. Yeah, okay, I believe that. Like you can see everybody's problems and you can even become obsessed with it. Um, these people are the great detectives. So they really do live, like they might show you their face up here, but they really live down here. Let's talk about the ninth house. So the ninth house, if you have your south node in the ninth house, your education, your belief systems. So imagine belief systems. How big is that? What you believe in, right? Like, oh, I, I believe in Catholicism. I believe in religion. I believe in, I, I, I don't even know what, but I believe in integrity, right? Um, what you believed in and how you traveled or experienced other cultures went wrong. So your belief system, the truth that became your truth and the truth that you lived by and died by uh, betrayed you. It wasn't what you thought it was going to be. It's like this QAnon. I mean, these, these, these people really, really believe in Q, QAnon. Um, and they, they really believe in it. And they, they'll come to find out that, okay, maybe, maybe that wasn't so accurate, right? So a belief system that you lived and died by betrayed you. It became untrue and you became self-righteous around this and probably persecuted. Also, your, uh, you, you probably were smarter than you were allowed to go to school. So if you were a woman, you know, and you were brilliant, well, then you had to write your book, pen your book by a man's name so it could get published. Um, and you probably, I mean, this is a giant house, but there, there is a need. The key to this is in the third house. So when you have your south node in the ninth house, you probably are, it's probably a little bit difficult to teach you something new. It's probably a little bit difficult to get you to adhere to a new truth system or belief system. Um, it, it's, it's probably a little bit hard. There's probably something kind of dogmatic about you. Do I have anybody who has a south node in the ninth house? It, it's very hard to tell a south node in the ninth house uh, a whole new perspective and they just buy it because they're really entrenched in the truths about their life, deep, deep, deep. Um, okay, so Jenna, tell me if you feel this. Okay, yeah, I do think your belief systems will be challenged because you are a Sag and you have your South Node in the ninth house in Sagittarius. Oh, you're not a Sag, but you have the ninth, you have the ninth, you, you have your South Node in the ninth house in Sagittarius, so you must be in Aries rising. And then the south node is in Sagittarius transiting. So I do think this is a time to be really open-minded, but the key lies in the third house where you need to become open-minded and you need to be willing to adapt and change things up and not be so dogmatic in your own truth. My truth is the way and the only way, right? Um, like if you're a deep Christian and you believe, well, you're Buddhist, you're going to hell, or oh, you study astrology, or oh, you're gay, you know, no, nope, no, nope, not for you. You're gay. You're not going. You're not going to heaven. You know, this is very ninth house at its at its rock bottom. And this this you experienced this. You were either persecuted because of a belief system that didn't that didn't allow you in it and persecuted you before, or you were the persecutor. So either side of the equation, this sucks. <laughs> but you are going to grow your amazing, beautiful, incredible self 
out of not wanting to persecute anybody and not wanting to be pers persecuted, right? Coach Michael, can you, can you relate at all? And so what, where the key is, is you have to become open-minded. You need to learn more data. You need to see more experiences. Um, you need to listen probably a little bit better. Let your heart and soul absorb, absorb um, new information. Find positivity in new things. Um, find out how, wow, um, they can live so differently. That's not for me, but I love it for them and it works for them because of X, Y, Z. And try to become non-threatening. Ninth house south nodes are, are threatening. They threaten. And I know you might not even feel that. You might not even feel like you're a big giant threat, but they're intimidating because they come banging in Boom, boom, boom. I got the truth about life, you know, and they're usually extraordinarily charming and confident and they come in with a lot of zest. And so they need to like tone it down and be a good listener <laughs> and try on different opinions like you'll try on different clothes. I mean, really like take in more information and be willing to sort of break yourself wide open and explore. And I know it sounds funny because this is the house of the explorer, but it's not the house of the objective explorer. This is the house of the dogmatic explorer. So it's like really taking on that North node in Gemini where you try on things sort of without the passion in a way. You, you try them on like a science experiment and you look for new hypotheses. Does that make sense? Does it, does anybody really feel this? I hope so. Um, the 10th house. So if you have your south node in the 10th house, you were a huge, enormous, enormous, powerful leader. You were an emperor. You were the CEO of your life. You were gargantuan. You were renowned. You were famous. You were well known. And you feel that in some way in this lifetime. But um, this was a huge, these are huge power leaders in your past life. Um, but you were invulnerable and you were fearless. And you probably cashed in on fame and fortune at the expense of people and love and truth and intimacy. And so it's almost like you got to live this giant power life and you might have even been hungry for more power, more fame, but you had nobody to share it with. I, I don't know if you guys have ever done this before, but this is what it kind of reminds me of. A long time ago in my 20s, I went to Hawaii all by myself and I was single and I went and I stayed at a gorgeous resort. I just wanted to treat myself and I was so lonely. Oh my God, I was so miserable. It was the worst decision. And I've traveled all around the world by myself, but this was just the worst. I checked myself into a fancy spa resort and uh, everywhere around me was just couples madly in love and honeymooners. I was all by myself, right? And so I just thought to myself, why did I do this? I had no intimacy. That vacation was so hollow. It was so vacant. It was so empty. I finally made it good and all that, and I got on a tour, but what did I have to do to make it feel rich and meaningful? I got on like a, uh, like a minivan tour and I made friends and I connected with people's hearts because it wasn't just about being in Hawaii. It was actually about connecting with souls and creating friendships that made Hawaii kind of come to life. Um, I'm not a codependent, by the way, so that story works for me, but I don't suggest that story for my, for my South Node seventh house people. If anything, I'm like too independent and I have to learn to connect. So that's, that's where that story comes from. Um, no, I'm on the 10th house right now. I am ether. Okay, so Jennifer, this is for you. Yeah. So with this huge appetite for power, for fame, for success, for fortune, for being my best self, for being gargantuan, for being amazing with, 
with the south node in the 10th house. And honestly, it kind of came easy to you. It might have even been handed to you. My God, you might have been next in line, right? Um, you got these giant opportunities and you found great success. And the ego probably overdeveloped. But now you're going to realize that it's really vacant. It's really, really freaking lonely at the top. I, I don't happen to know that. <laughs> I don't know that that trauma, but that's how these people felt. And so there was either too much success, too fast, too big, too quick, and it did them in, or, or they could never be big enough. They could never live up to the expectations. They could never get good enough. They could never be at the number one billboard charts for longer than a nanosecond, right? Always chasing the fame, always chasing the glory, just to sometimes never even get it. It's like literally chasing the, the, the gold at the end of the rainbow where the leprechauns say it is, only to get there and go, wait, there's no rainbow, there's no leprechauns, and there's no freaking gold. What the hell? What have I been doing this? It's the golden handcuffs. And so it's, it's interesting because the key is in the fourth house, developing love developing the ability to nurture other people, developing a sanctuary where there is literally stillness and nothingness except me and you. No money, no fame, no fortune, no autographs to sign, nothing. Nothing but me and you together, whoever me is in your story. And this is about learning how to nurture others, learning how to feel your feelings, learning how to build and grow supportive relationships, learning how to be the person who knows how to love another the way they want to be loved, not the way you want to love. Yeah, you want to buy them a car to say, I support you and I love you. No, they don't want the car. They, they don't want the car. They want the conversation. They want the hug. They want the hot tea when they have a sore throat. That's all they want. They just want you to crawl into their bed and give them a hug platonically. You know, they just want you to put a cool compress on there. They just want you to come over and check their mail and walk their mail to their house, right? Little things. And so this is about going as deep as possible into the soul's connection with other people. This is the house of the soul. This house is so deep because it's literally the underbelly. Um, it's like the eighth house. It doesn't come with that kind of power, but it comes with that kind of love. And so learning how to support others and love others in their love language and how to receive love, and how to do the emotional aspect of life, not just the success, fame, money, and career. Okay, the 11th house, South Node. Um, the South Node in the 11th house, you know, these people had to amputate themselves from society in a way, um, in order to survive their existence. They had to cut themselves off and they became quite alone. Now, I will also tell you that these people could have gotten swept away inside social causes. And the social cause, um, this is another way that this South Node in the 11th can happen. The social cause disconnected themselves from themselves. So they became the cause. So let's say just today, one of the causes today, you know, Black Lives Matter movement. Maybe you've merged so deeply with the movement that now everybody who sees me just sees Black Lives Matter movement, right? Or I'm a feminist, let's say, and I'm out there championing women all the time. And so now people aren't having a relationship with me. They're having a relationship with, oh, she's the feminist. Oh, she's the Black Lives Matter movement. Oh, she's the, uh, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders fan, whatever. And they see the cause in me. Um, but they don't see me anymore. So they merged so deeply with a cause that they became alienated from them own, from their own selves. And they may not have even followed their own heart. They may have done it the way society told them to do it, that the way their group or their organization told them to do it. They, this can be a cult following as well. But they cut off their own emotions for the greater good of the community or the greater good of the universe. So they believe only to lose themselves completely. They also overuse their minds and they also believe that intellectualism is the deal. Like the 10th house believes fame, fortune, and success is the deal. Intellectualism is the deal. In my mind is the way out of this. And so they they forget to feel. They, they forget the heart. And this is like a group karma. So pick your friends. If you have a South Node in 
um, Aquarius or in the 11th house, pick your friends wisely because you will become your friends. So if you're, you know, high, let's just talk high school. If you're in the high school, you know, nerd group, you're, you're going to be known as the nerd and it's going to be hard for you to get a redo and you're not going to get to be able to be the cool cat, if you will. Not that that is even important. I'm just giving you an example. If you're not a pothead, don't hang out with the potheads because they're going to see you collectively as the pothead unless you want to be known as one. Um, no judgment on that. I'm just saying, like, choose the friendships, circles, groups, and organizations that you really want to be affiliated with because with this south node there, you can easily lose your identity to the group consensus. And it can be painful and lonely and alienating. And it's hard to get a redo, right? Like you don't get redos on first impressions. Um, you don't. You get to make a second or third if people are generous to you. But somebody who's watching me for the very first time, I don't get to make a, se a second impression. Um, you know what I'm saying? A lot of people write you off right at the first. Um, the key here is to develop your own will and your own personal goals and to make your goals original, not just group consensus thinking, and to create joy and make your goals exciting goals and stay on your path that creates joy and fun and do not lose your individual unique self-expression in this lifetime. It's absolutely critical that you're bold enough to do you and, um, Learn the joy of the creative process. What do you want to create that you're not creating that's personal to you? Um, and it's also, I want to tell you, I think the most important thing in this one is to learn childlike love, like gleeful love, like jump on the trampoline, eat ice cream cones and popsicles and um, cotton candy and, you know... <laughs> <laughs> like eat black licorice ice cream or blue ice cream that gives you a total blue mouth and a blue tongue and go around and talk to people like you don't care because you're so happy. It's like be so wildly uniquely in your own creativity, your own happiness and joy that you are connected at such a childlike heart level, hula hooping and riding your bike, um, that you are deeply connected at the heart level and you're living out your own uniqueness, your own creation, and not just doing group consensus and hiding within a group. Okay, the 12th house. Oh my gosh. And then I have to go because I've got a board meeting. I have my board president coming over. Uh, do you guys know that I work on this board for helping little senior citizens? Mm. Um. In the 12th house, if you have your south node here, and stay with me because I'm going to tell you which placement doesn't need to reincarnate again. Hold on. Let me tell my friend that I need her to, like, slow it down and come over in just a few minutes. Hang on. Hold on. I'm buying more time. Okay, alien in the woods, I'm so glad that you made it here. Okay, so in the 12th house, South Node, this is really tough. Um, this is a tough placement because the ego was in dissolution for many, many lifetimes. What do I mean by that? The ego, the thing that keeps you alive, um, the fight or flight part of you, it dissolved. And it became a victim to something or someone. And it suffered great losses illnesses, hospitalizations, and it was maybe even in solitary confinement or jail. Um, it comes with being in touch with pain like no other placement. There is deep, deep pain with this placement. And so it seeks a lot of reassurance in this lifetime, but it may not even find all the reassurance that it really needs in one lifetime. And, um, other people who are involved with the South Node in the 12th house can get overwhelmed because they can feel that the South Node 12th house person needs far more than what they can actually give. Um, and it's because they've had so much hardship and challenges in past lifetimes. But 
they have to develop a relationship with sort of grounded, pragmatic, healthy living on a daily basis. They have to have pragmatic, concrete goals that they strive for and that they they tackle, not just live in the spiritual dimension of life, but actually contribute on a daily basis to to mastering their art, mastering their talent, mastering their craft, mastering their gift, staying connected to others, being in service to someone or something, not in a way where their ego dissolves, but in a way where they truly add value. So they don't just disappear, alienate and withdraw into the nothing land of life. And they have to stay focused and committed and loyal uh, to their goals to per to perfect them. I use that word very carefully to perfect them because there is no such thing. But they are here to hone their ta talents and to become a value and service to others to mean something to someone else and to eventually become a mentor stepping into the mentorship their, the mentorship of their craft. This is a deep, deep spiritual placement. And there, this is a deep, deep belief in God, in the universe, in a higher power. So channeling that higher power, but putting it into a practical way in a daily basis to create the healthiest version of themselves. The sixth house is healthy. I also think the sixth house is the most misunderstood house of the entire zodiac. And it is the house of self-mastery to the point of I have mastered myself, so I lend myself to you or my crafts in mentorship to teach you how to fish, right? I'm not going to go fish for you. I'm going to teach you how to fish. And, um, and this is, I wish I could answer all those questions, but I have to stay on ta task um, because I've got two people arriving at my house wanting to plan a uh, an event that I promised I would help with. But what I want to say to you is if you have this placement, this is this is one thing that I want you to understand. I want you to go look at every single person who you love, including your spouse, your parents, and your children, and look at their south node because they are interacting with you when they're when they're not being their best self, they are interacting with you from a place that comes from their south node. So when somebody's being mean to you, you figure out what their south node is. And they are doing their south node on you because that's where we revert to when we are in our lower octave. Um, the north node in the sixth requires to find peace. Yes. And productivity, peacefulness inside productivity. I would say that. Um, and the other thing I want to tell you is which placement doesn't need to. I promised you this. Which placement does not need to um, does not need to incarnate again. Are you ready for this? I want you guys to tell me if you know anybody who has this placement. I met this woman one time in all the readings I've ever done. I met a woman who had this placement only one in all of the readings I've ever done. It's so rare. If you have a 29 degree south node in Pisces in the 12th house, it has to be in the 12th house. You probably are an earth angel in this lifetime and you probably do not have to incarnate. You get to move on to become a guardian angel, um, a spirit guide, and then an ascended master. So I believe we would step into the role of guardian angel, which visits on earth and goes back and forth and helps people cross over. Um, um, or a spirit guide. And that's that next level or the ascended master. And so if you know anybody, if you see a chart that is, oh my gosh, my husband is a 29 degree south node Pisces um, in the 12th house, that is huge. If it's the north node, they're going to come back and they're going to do that last lifetime in the next lifetime. Did you get that? So if it's south node, they probably don't have to incarnate. If it's the north node, 29 degree north node in, um, not in Pisces, it doesn't have to be in Pisces, but 29 degree south node um, in the 12th house, yes, in Pisces, 
um, they don't have to incarnate again. But if it's a 29th degree Aries in the 12th house, they still have to incarnate. So it does have to be in the sign of Pisces because they are at the end of the end of the end. The 29th degree Pisces is the very last degree of the whole entire zodiac. The 12th house at the 29th degree is the last degree of the whole circle. And Pisces is the last sign, so it's triple end. And so that is that is the culmination. And those, if you know that person, that person is probably so enlightened. So if it's 28 degrees, nope, they're still gonna come back. 29th degree. Um, Audrey in Texas is so sweet, sent me $20. Um, my door is going to ring. Uh, let's just see. I have all these super supporters. Okay, I have three super chat questions. Susie's going to give them to me. Um, April says, this is for my boyfriend. North Node is in the eighth house in Cancer and South Node, second house in Capricorn. And mine was in Taurus and Scorpio, fifth house. Okay, so what's the question about it? What does it mean? Okay, hold on. Okay, they just said they're ready to come. So I might not be able to get to do everybody's super chat. Um, and if you want to, um, if you want, if whoever sent me a super chat, if you want to email me, um, I'll tell you, I will answer your question for you offline, but I will, um, I'll tell you how I'll do it. Just email me at soulnavigation1111 at gmail.com. I think I just have three of them. So Susie can write the people down there that can email me their question. I can't do everybody. I'm so sorry. I love you. But uh, my people are waiting for me out on my front porch. Yay. So I just want to tell uh, April. She asked me, sorry, I have to go. My little boys are calling mama to say goodnight. Wouldn't miss their. Okay. So she asked me, I think what the, let's just see, April, I'll just answer this and then you can come back and listen to it. But um So the south node in the second house is about building self-worth. And how, how does he need to do that? Well, he needs to do that through deep vulnerability and intimacy and learning how to have a relationship with somebody without giving all his power away, but developing enough self-worth that he can really provide for himself and he can provide for security emotionally, financially, physically, in all ways. I hope you guys love this. And let me know if you are a super supporter, if you would like to come to a happy hour, let me know. I hope you're wonderful. And um, yes, please leave a comment on here and share this video, like, subscribe. Thank you for your super chats. And thank you for being a super supporter. And I just adore you and uh, that wonderful, sweet person who gave me, Audrey in Texas, who ever gave me $20. That was just so stinking sweet of you. Mwah, mwah, mwah. I just adore you. Take good care, you guys. Okay, bye.